We will uh, commence the hearing at uh, 1.50. We're going to start with a meeting from the governor. I am pleased to nominate Susan Sardin Tierney to the position of Associate Justice of the Probate Family Court, Suffolk County Division. Uh, and we can close the nominees for resume. So congratulations on your nomination. Thank you. I would ask that anyone who's going to testify today to stand or raise your right hand. And that would include me, I assume. That would include you. Yeah. <laughs> Just way to tell the truth, I'll tell the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I apologize that uh, the other counsels aren't here yet. They will be here shortly. As you know, we ran late for the uh, last hearing, um, and they ran out for lunch, and they'll, they'll, they'll be finally as they come in over to do that. Um, but uh, and we'll wait for you to introduce your people to them as well. We can certainly get started with the witnesses. So um, I will first call the Honorable Arthur O'Reilly. Would you like to stand or sit, or would you be comfortable, Judge? Standing is fine. Okay, go. Good afternoon, yeah. Counsel Ferrer. My name is Arthur O'Reilly. I'm an Associate Justice of the Honorable Probate Family Court. I was before this committee eight and a half years ago uh, for my nomination hearing. Uh, the first thing I want to point out, uh, Counsel Ferrer, is that being a judge for me, it's an incredible privilege, and I am humbled every day that I take the bench, knowing the enormity, the issues that must be decided by the court every day. And if I had other council members here today, particularly uh, Councilor Marilyn Petito Dubay, I would thank her personally for voting for me eight and a half years ago and giving me an opportunity uh, to be a judge. How about, about Ayanella? Do you vote for you? Just Ayanella? No, there's a seat. Not in this <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> I had a unanimous order. I was lucky. Exactly. Now, uh, before I became a judge, I practiced in Marshall County for 21 years. And uh, in that capacity, I got to know Attorney Tierney quite well. She and I had cases uh, against each other. I saw her around the courthouse frequently. And uh, I came to know her as a very, very talented, educated and committed attorney. One of the few lawyers that I felt that I could truly trust no matter what the issue was, and also somebody that I could pick up the phone and call and talk to her about some issues, whether it was a particular aspect of law uh, or a case that I had before a judge. And I know that my opinion of her, which was incredibly high, was shared by all the other lawyers who practiced in Barnesville County, as well as the two judges when I practiced with Judge Scandori and Judge Terry. So then I became a judge eight and a half years ago, and I saw Attorney Terry even more frequently as a judge, because she routinely appeared before me, it seemed to me, two, three times per week. And I always found her incredibly prepared, very well versed, extremely articulate, but most importantly, she was a fair and reasonable lawyer at all times. Now, the Judge O'Donoghue will agree with me that when you're in the probate family court, there are certain lawyers that you come to rely upon to appoint to difficult cases to represent children, to represent them mentally, uh, an individual with mental health issues, and so forth, as a guardian ad litem. And because of Susan's outstanding work as a lawyer, and her commitment to her clients, I frequently call upon Susan for appointments as a guardian ad litem to represent children, to represent somebody that had mental health issues. And she always, always did an outstanding job no matter who she represented. And something that's very important, I think, for this council to understand is it didn't matter whether Susan was representing somebody pro bono because I had appointed her on that difficult case or whether she was getting her normal hourly fee from a high-priced attorney, a high-priced client in Osterville or someplace else. The level of her commitment to her client was no different whether she was being paid zero or she was being paid two or three hundred dollars per hour. And I will also tell you, Counselor Pereira, that the attorney's attorney was a lawyer who represented all of the people of Cape Cod. Not just men, not just women, children, you name it. Her practice was very much like my practice. She represented the people of Cape Cod. Now, I told you earlier, and I wasn't bragging, but I did say that I had an 8-0 vote when I came before this committee, and I would tell you this. I believe the attorney attorney is far more qualified 
as a judge than I was when I sat in this very chair. She has my absolute, complete confidence that I couldn't recommend a lawyer higher for this position. And I can think of no other lawyer who is more qualified to be a justice of the probate of Italy Court. I humbly ask you and all other committee members to give her your vote for this position. We need, as citizens of the Commonwealth, to have a superb attorney like her serve in the bank. Thank you very much. Judge Coyley, uh, yes. we introduce uh, Council Ayanella. Council of Good afternoon. Council of Good afternoon. Last time I saw you was eight and a half years ago. <laughs> I did the right thing? You did the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I got some questions for you. Okay. Oh, hold ready. on. Okay. Uh, and this is a question I, when I see Judge O'Donius in the corridor, or even when she's, I'm sorry, when she's on the, in the witness stand, I mentioned to the nominee. Marrow assets. Yes. Is someone's business a marital asset? If yes, if no, and well, let's do that first. Someone, because I, I hear a lot of things, I'm downtown Boston, uh, and I get different answers with different nominees that come before me. Oh. So it's not like they all say the same thing. Okay. They're all, not only all, but I think it's like 60 40. Okay. So that shouldn't be right. It's on like, we talk about judge shopping all the time. Depending on what side you are, you'd want to judge shop on this issue because it could be a big issue to someone, and who knows? So, tell me, your, what does a business mean to you when you talk about a marital asset? Well, first of all, Chapter 208, Section 34 uh, defines uh, the factors that the court has to consider in dividing marital assets and also gives the court a great direction in terms of what is and what is not a marital asset. A marital asset, believe it or not, can be something that was acquired prior to the marriage, something acquired during the marriage, or even sometimes in unique circumstances, something acquired after the marriage. A business that is begun during the marriage by a spouse is absolutely a marital asset. How it gets divided is something else altogether different. Now, you might have gotten 60 or 40 percent from different lawyers, but so, you can take that to the bank. Okay, so a law firm would be a marital asset. It could be. It could be. What depending upon said, the circumstances. How about under your hypothetical? I, I don't spouse, know enough about the hypothetical. I'm going to tell you. Okay. I'm going to tell you about it. The spouse started the practice mm -hmm. after the marriage. Okay. So what would you have to, what would you need to know to see if the law firm is an asset, a marital asset? It depends. Uh, when I was in practice, I represented a lawyer going through a divorce case, and uh, the lawyer for the wife said the exact same thing, that his law practice was a marital asset subject to division. My argument in that case was that he was a solo practitioner, and uh, when he left uh, the law firm, the law firm was, was him. And so that it wasn't an asset. And so I think it's, uh, it, it depends. How big is a law firm? How many attorneys work there? Uh, Let's is assume it one? Is it two? Let's assume the point, is, the, point uh, the answer to your question, however, is yes, it could be an asset. How it gets divided depends upon the facts and circumstances Let's of the case. Let's assume it's a big law practice. <laughs> Let's assume it's 15 lawyers, 75 paralegals. Mm -hmm. Marital asset? Again, my answer is that it could be your marital asset, and the question is what is the value of it, and whether, how do you split up a law firm? Can you split the law firm up to, to pay somebody off? It's well, a marital asset. Right. Maybe you'd be looking at other assets well, to no, I didn't satisfy that division. Well, that's what I'm talking about. That wasn't my question. My question was that, a mar would you consider that, my hypothetical, a marital asset? Division, this, how you're going to pay the other person, the other spouse, that's a totally different question. Maybe the no question maybe. in my mind that a law firm would be considered a marital asset, period. That's the answer. So in my hypothetical, you, is, it, is, is it or not? I and just told you. A law be. firm could be a marital it, it asset. It could not be. Correct. So you don't feel comfortable answering my question? I'm answering your question. So I'll ask it one more time. Then I'm, I'm not going to answer it again because you've already asked me three times. So I don't know if it's a marital asset. It could, everything could or could not. The Red Sox could win tonight. Right. They, they may not win. Mm -hmm. But if it's an asset that's acquired during the course of the marriage, which the one party has an interest in, yes, it's a marital asset. Okay. 
uh, that's definitely the minority. Well, let me ask you this. I don't, what's this term goodwill? What is all that about when I hear some of the, some of the nominees say, well, it depends if it's goodwill. Does that mean anything? Well, goodwill typically has to do with the reputation of the business and the community and its ability to generate income. So does that have anything to do with whether in my hypothetical, whether it's a marital asset or not? It doesn't really have that much to do with whether or not it's an asset. It might have more to do with the value of the asset. Why do you care about the value of the asset if it's not a marital asset? I didn't say I did. I'm asking you, do you? <laughs> do I care about an asset if it's not a marital asset? Do you care about the value of the asset? Yes, if it's, I do, because it would, it would have to be listed on an individual's financial statement. And anything that's listed on the financial statement, I'm interested to know what the value of that is. is. Well, I'll ask the nominee. I've got to tell you, I have no clue what you were talking about. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Judge, I think we have another question for you. Sure. I'll give you a little. All right. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. Uh, I was interested in your comment about when they've gotten an eight to nothing vote. So let me ask you somebody gets a five to three vote. Oh, okay. right. <laughs> right. Right. In 40 years of sitting in courtrooms, not once, not once, has any lawyer said to me, hey, Bob, you know this judge has only got five or six votes at the governor's council. Right. You're right. You're it's right. like a bar exam. You don't know what you got in the bar exam. You don't want to ask you. you don't want to ask you. <laughs> so, I thought, and Councilor Ryan know brought up the law firm, I was under the impression that a law firm is somewhat different of an asset than, let's say, a hardware store. Because the law firm is made up of clients, correct? Right. And they have files and all clients. So I don't own that case. Lawyer, merely representing what the client is right. and getting paid. But if I sell my, if I, if, if in a divorce, um, my ex wife would say, okay, I'm going to get a value of And it's okay, but who am I going to sell it to? Because those clients that are free to will to say, I had to do them. You're not a lawyer, I'm not hiring on you. So I, I always thought it was sort of a different kind of asset. Because you couldn't, you know, unlike the hardware store, I sell the hardware store in the square. People are still going to go to that store and buy nails and bricks and they buy it. But the law firm, we put a value on it, let's say a million dollars. If my ex five hundred thousand, the clients so even for the divorce, I'm going to get another client, and they leave. And I got one client left. Me end up with paying my life and having nothing left. I think the, the uh, whether it's an asset is a different question from what the value of the asset is, and I think that. Your law firm, you had a law firm that you established for the course of your career, could very well be a marital asset. But I think the issue is what's the work? What would somebody pay to have Attorney Juvenile's law practice? Because when Attorney Juvenile stops working at that practice, all the clients are going to go with him. Go yeah. somewhere else. Right. Which is exactly uh, in a case, as I said, where I represented the attorney, was the argument that I made to the judge. Uh, and I think in that case, the judge found that it was in fact a marital asset, but it really was very little value to it at all. Because when the attorney stopped practicing, there was nobody that was going to go there. He was practicing. So, okay, the last thing uh, you came through this council about eight years ago? Yeah, I just did. Okay. And uh, so. Governor nominated you, right? Right. Fancy word for recommended. The council hired you. Right. So I bring this up. I 
bringing up with all analogies now because it won't have to scale back. The different functions that are embedded in the human stone, the virtue, the government, the anonymous, the class, the lieutenant governor, the governor's lawyer, the governor's doctor, and everybody else. I wait and I don't hear them say, I want to thank the governor's council. So I ask you respectfully, I put in your turn. Any other questions? Also, the lady. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. I think I've seen you in 12 years. Well, eight and a half years ago. Eight and a half. Okay. You were in the room when I said uh, to uh, Council Ferrara that I wish that uh, Mrs. Uh, Petito Cheney was here so that I could personally thank her oh, okay. for voting for me eight and a half years ago. Eight and a half, I'm sorry. It's a privilege it's been to serve as a judge of the program. Oh, it was my pleasure, really. And I apologize for coming. We've got about 10 minutes to run to try to get some good blood, and it's right here. I, I couldn't finish eating because I had to get back. So um, it's unfortunate that with this hearing was scheduled so quickly. And um, I, I want to apologize to everyone because I have to be late. It's very important to me. And I will listen to the tape to listen to what okay. you have said. Um, so, how are you enjoying it? I love it. It's, uh, it's an incredible uh, job, it's an unbelievable opportunity. Walk on the bench every day, and do, uh, in my opinion, try to help, try to solve some problems, and try to treat people with respect, and give them an opportunity to present their point in case great. every day. That's great. Well, that's quite a tribute to have you representing this. You talked about, and I believe that uh, yeah. it's very very That's great. That's great. That and um, I have never been, and like my colleague, because I'm not a lawyer, I have never been invited to anyone's retirement party. <laughs> And uh, so you thank me today. <laughs> I've been four years. <laughs> okay, put me on your list. Thank you. Thank you very much. Judge, are you seeing the norm of uh, shared physical custody in this case? I'm sorry, we were a fan of shared physical custody as a norm as opposed to visitation of the days past? First of all, I don't use the term <coughs> visitation because visitation you know, is one of your right. It's right. more or less That's a security right. position. So I call it comparative. Yes, in terms of time. And whenever it's appropriate and in a child's best interest, I'm absolutely okay. A shared physical, a shared custody. See the nominee advocating for that on a regular basis? I see the uh, nominee advocating on a regular basis for her client, whether that's the husband in the case, whether that's an unmarried father, or an unmarried mother, or in cases where she represents the children. The best interest of the child. Absolutely. What about uh, when the youngest twins 18 and the guidelines don't apply? What do you see happening with that? What do you, what do, you do? Well, uh, the, uh, the guidelines don't apply. Uh, and we're, we're talking about the child support guidelines. Yes. So it really depends. In those cases, it, it, it could depend. I mean, a lot of times you might have an 18-year-old graduating from high school going off to college. Now we're talking about how college expenses will be paid. Obviously, if somebody's paying a certain amount of child support, let's say $250 a week, and you now the child goes off to of college, from my perspective, is ever paying child support, A, because the guidelines don't apply, the child support is probably going to go down. Um, if for no other reason, because the child's away from home nine months out of the year in college, and B, because that individual would be called upon to also contribute to the college expenses. So if I have, if I have Case where the child's going off to college, 18 years old or 19, the child's foot's going to go down considerably uh, in consideration of college expenses. What do you think about the constitutionality of the government telling parents to have to go to college and have to go more? Well, under, under our statutes, as it relates to child support and continuous support for any educated children, Court does have the authority uh, to make an order relative to the college expenses and child support. I know that's the law. Do you think the Constitution is going to challenge it for you? No, I would not challenge it. My job as a judge is to enforce it. No, I understand that. I'm saying that I never brought that up to the No, nobody has. <laughs> the constitutionality of, uh, of uh, ordering the parent to pay child support? Sure, I think it's the protection problem. Uh, I don't see it that way, but I suppose that argument could be made. But well, why should you have to tell me on the board that he's paying for kid education when you're 
Obviously, an attorney for the child, obviously, is an attorney. Generally, who, what type of person uh, is appointed GAL? Is that like well, it depends. We have uh, different kinds of GALs. We have a, what's called a Category F GAL. That would be a guardian ad litem who investigates. So, in a case such as that, I would appoint somebody and I would give them specific questions that I would like them to investigate and answer and maybe make recommendations. They have to take a certain number of classes courses and hours to be able to be eligible to be on the Category F list that's promulgated by the uh, Supreme Judicial Court and also maintained by the Chief's Office in our court. Uh, we also have what's called a Category E GAL. Category E GAL is somebody with a, a background either in psychology or social work. And the Category E GAL is somebody who would be appointed in cases where you might have mental health issues that a lawyer just doesn't have the expertise to dive into. And who pays for these uh, people? Well, it depends. We could have a, a, what we call a private pay GAL if the parties have significant assets or enough assets and income to pay, and it would be a private pay GAL. If they don't have the assets or income to pay for a private GAL, and the court feels that it's necessary and appropriate to appoint a GAL, then the Commonwealth. In the same situation, if it's an attorney? No, the attorney does not get paid by the Commonwealth. Nine times out of ten, the attorney is pro bono. <coughs> very informal on that topic. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank, you. thank you very much for uh, joining today. Um, do you have something for you? I just want to thank you for not saying he's listening to children. I thought that was thrown out. Yeah, we don't say we don't say this. That's awful. No, no parents should be listening. I agree. Well, thank you for what you do. I know that that's a busy court, especially with the families breaking down and whatever's happening in our society. I'm sure you're very busy over there. Yeah. So thank you for your service. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you for your service. Thank you for coming all the way to Boston today. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Linda Locken, the assistant register in Boston. <laughs> you can sit or stand, whatever you uh, want to do for that chair. <laughs> yes. Yes. What are you comfortable with? Very comfortable back in Boston. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak on behalf of Susan Sarton. It's a pleasure. To come. I've known Susan for 19 years. We first met Boston Family Court in 1998. <laughs> when I was the front counter person at the registry, Susan was the employee in the community. I helped Susan filing complaints in other court, as well as retrieving files for her family. I then moved on to trial assignment and helped Susan with the coordinating court hearings. I am presently the assistant register in the district court of the county. I assist Susan with all of those decisions. I found Susan to be knowledgeable, courteous, and helpful to all the registry staff, attorneys, and litigants. It's a good day when Susan volunteers to help me. This is a program designed to help. Not to hire an attorney, and the 
here in favor of the nominee? Anyone in favor of the nominee? Patrick McKay. Um, my name is Patrick McKay, but I'm the co chair of the Public the Coalition. And whenever there's nominees for the candidate, we're always interested in speaking with them. Uh, the nominee was kind enough to speak to me. Uh, we spoke about a couple of issues I'm just going to uh, mention two and uh, explain what uh, my understanding and what she's going to do. The first, the first issue we spoke of were temporary orders. Uh, this is the uh, first time you go to court and you, and you get orders from the judge. Hearings are usually about 15 minutes and a half an hour long. Um, back in the day when I was first involved in the courts, in that short amount of time, I often saw parents lose the custody of their children. No real arguments being made to the judge, it's just practice. Um, I'm hoping that's not going to happen anymore. Everyone I've spoken to has made it pretty clear there's no real legal basis for doing that, although the practice is well known. We both acknowledge that there are extenuating circumstances, DCF involved, police involved, wild allegations that may be appropriate. But in general, no one should be losing custody of the children, and both parents at that point uh, should be able to have 50 50 time with their child. Because uh, the judge really doesn't have enough information to do anything else. The other issue uh, I spoke about had to do with supervised visitation. As we've been pushing for the courts to um, follow the laws and treat people actively, um, we've also seen new techniques used to hamstring that. And one of the things we've seen is uh, the spread of supervised visitation. Um, the nominee again said that she'd only use supervised visitation in extreme situations. Uh, where the facts of the case merit it rather than just trying to use it to make one side or the other side happy. Um, we think this is the direction we want the courts to go in, and so we support the nominee because she said she would. Thank you for your testimony. Councilor Jewelville. Pardon me? You don't need to. Well, one, you can supervise it. it uh, if you've ever been on one of those, kind of do feel that kind of thing. Very good. Also, the main. I just want to thank Patrick for coming. He has represented the Chicago Coalition very well. And um, to get in touch with the nominees to talk with them and to see what they just to really see what their positions are. Because years ago, started in 2010 or 2011. Have you seen a difference in the way, because uh, you're a strong advocate uh, for children's rights, and as time goes on, have you seen judges changing from 2009 to the present with respect to shared parenting? parenting? What, what, what I have seen is we've had the conversation. There, there, there's a lot of uh, cliches that have been thrown around on the courts. When, as you have the conversation, and this, I think you can see this with other issues, uh, that are brought up here. If you have a conversation and kind of make it clear that cliche is baseless and doesn't really help the conversation, we, we start getting away from those cliches. We start talking about real issues. So what I see happening is we're talking about real issues. We are seeing some judges uh, really trying trying to help people out rather than just uh, one size fits all solutions. So I am seeing some improvement. I'm still hearing about the problems as well. Well, that's good. I'm, uh, you know, we hear the word the term joint physical custody. Yes. Uh, to me, you know, joint, that can be 90%, 10%. That's joint physical custody. I'm a strong advocate, as you know. I've been here a long time, you know, even before you. I'm a strong advocate of shared 50-50 physical custody. Are you seeing that, your group? more and more, and if not 50-50, are we getting closer? Because I remember when I first started, it was uh, every other weekend and, uh, you know, Wednesdays, you know, seven to nine. 
what we are seeing uh, is the wealthy people, where you have two uh, parents working, are tending to get those solutions. It's troubling to see that it's coming out that way, but that is what we are seeing. The wealthy are benefiting uh, from rights and everyone's rights. Which is not right, but thank you again, and uh, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Anyone else in favor of the nominee? Anyone against the nominee? Anyone against the nominee? All right, we're going to close that session. And now we're going to hear from the nominee, so feel free, Julie uh, Tierney, to work. Uh, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I'd like to recognize, thank you, Chief Justice Ordonez of the Probate Family Court for coming today. My husband, Rob Tierney. We met Holly Hardy. Attorney Suzanne Hicks and Attorney Ray Yox were both former colleagues of mine from Legal Services. Judge Riley, who you met. My son, Ethan. My brother and sister in law, Howard Sard, Rowena Nelson. Uh, Attorney Canella Richardson, who's a Attorney, I've had cases with on the case, and you've met um, Assistant Register Larkin and her husband, Ron. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just interrupt for a second. I want to introduce uh, formally uh, uh, Council of Mount Teal Debate, Council of Mary Burley. Uh, my colleagues, I had a scheduled meeting with the Chief Justice of the Superior Court. So uh, I'm here. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Now we'll hear from okay, you. thank you. I'd like to start by thanking all the members of the Governor's Council for your consideration and your time in evaluating my nomination. And I do appreciate that you are the ones who will be giving me this job if you do, and that nobody else has that role up here. Um, I do also want to thank the Governor, Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, uh, the Governor's Chief Legal Counsel, uh, Lankovic, and Sharon Casey. Nominating Commission, as well as all the members of the Judicial Nominating Commission, for their efforts and their support of me to this point. I really have a new appreciation of the rigorous process we put uh, judicial nominees, applicants through in this Commonwealth, and it's a credit to the state that we do this. Um, it's been a long time coming for me to be at this point, and now I'm humbly um, trying to present myself and ask for your support. Um, in addition, I also want to thank all of my family, friends, and supporters for taking time out of their busy lives to be here for me today. I also want to recognize a couple of key family members who could not be here today. My parents, Eugene and Edith Sard, who I am still so lucky to have in my lives, are age 89 and 93. They still live in my childhood home in Huntington, New York. And while they're both very mentally sharp, physically, especially my dad, is more frail. And although they would have been thrilled to be here today with me, um, it was really just too much for them to travel from New York. I wanted to recognize them because I know how excited they are for me to be here at this point. I also want to recognize my other two children who could not be here besides Ethan. My daughter Miranda is currently living in Beijing, China, teaching English. And my son Jordan is currently serving in the United States Army as an intelligence analyst. He's stationed presently at Fort Meade, Maryland, um, but he's just re-enlisted and is about to be re-signed to Peace in Germany. So, you know, they're very happy and proud for me, too, and um, I'm just incredibly proud of all three of my children. So I want to give you a little bit of background about me as a person. I'll try to be brief and mindful of uh, the late hour. Um, just to help you understand who I am and how I got to be here today. Um, my parents are first-generation Americans. All four of my grandparents were born in Eastern Europe and were brought here by my great-grandparents when we were children which is a fortunate thing since my family is Jewish and they left the time. Um, but all four of my grandparents, although they were immigrants, went to college, City College of New York, and became teachers or school administrators. Education has always been stressed in my family as the absolute path to success. My dad is a World War II vet. He served in the Navy and the Pacific Theater, and he would have been part of the invasion of Japan had he not dropped the atomic bomb. He, became, he was an electrical engineer, and he worked in that career his whole professional life. My mom had been a teacher, but she uh, stayed home full time with my old brothers and myself during our childhood, and then went back to being a proofreader for a publishing company um, the last 15 years of her working life. Um, my parents, oh, I cannot express enough what I owe to them. They are the most down-to-earth, unpretentious people you could ever meet. They, they didn't lecture me, they didn't 
say, this is how you need to be. They just showed me. You work hard, you're a good person, you give back to your community, you have, you're honest, you're kind to everyone you meet. This is what they showed me every day of my life. And I am so thankful and I'm grateful that I still have them in my life. Um, I wanted to be a lawyer since I was about 10 years old. You know, that probably sounds a little strange, but and perhaps it was suggested to me because I uh, had a propensity for arguing points of rules and things like that with teachers and parents and whatnot. But to me, it was an honorable profession and it was a way to help people. I had an older cousin who was a legal services attorney, and to me, she was a model of how you could be a lawyer, have a profession, and do good in this world and help people. So I went to Northeastern University School of Law because it was known for having turning out public interest lawyers. Um, I also very much enjoyed and benefited from the co-op program that Northeastern has even in the law school because in your second and third year, half of your time is spent working full time in the legal field and half is spent in school. I was able to do three out of my four co-op jobs in legal services programs where I was actually able to represent real clients in court or in administrative hearings under student practice rules. My fourth co-op job was with the Board of Bar Overseers Office of the Bar Council. Um, not to sound like a goody two-shoes or corny, but I consider myself a person of integrity and ethics, and I don't like lawyers who give the rest of our profession that. After law school, I was fortunate enough to be offered a two-year clerkship with the Honorable Shane Vine, who at that time was the Chief Justice of the United States District Court for the District of New Hampshire, where I learned a lot about a good trial court judge, his demeanor in the courtroom, his handling of cases. It was a great experience. And actually, in the second year, the way Judge um, Devine structured his clerkships, his, when you were there in your second year, you became a liaison between his chambers and the clerk's office, and I learned a lot about the workings of the clerk's office, the support that that helps in the administration of justice. Um, when I finished the two-year clerkship, I was actually offered and turned down a job at the Attorney General's office in New Hampshire, because I had been offered a job at New Hampshire Legal Assistance, and that had been my career goal, was to be a legal services attorney. I practiced in New Hampshire Legal Assistance for eight years, and in representing low-income clients on a very wide variety of civil legal problems. And in addition to the individual cases that I took, I had the opportunity to brief and argue on a case to the New Hampshire Supreme Court, and I was also co-counsel on a class action lawsuit in the federal district court regarding uh, Medicaid-eligible children's access to dental care. I moved from New Hampshire back to Massachusetts in 1995. <coughs> I did take three years off from the practice of law at that time after the birth of my third child. And when I returned to the practice of law in 1998, it was with Legal Services for Cape Cod and Islands, which is now known as South Coastal County's Legal Services. And that's where I started practicing primarily in the area of family law and realized that I had a real affinity for it and skill at it and developed an expertise in all areas of domestic relations. Um, I enjoyed that practice very much, but in 2007, I was going through a divorce myself I had children starting college, and I came to the conclusion that I could not afford to continue to work for legal services. At that time, a local law firm, the firm that I'm still with, Donnie Green, McNichols, and Garner, was looking for a family law attorney because they were primarily a real estate practice and wanted to become more of a full-service law firm. And I had been recommended to them by um, one of the assistant registers of the probate court at the time. At the time, I think I was concerned that I wasn't going to be able to continue my quest for public interest law, but in fact, I think it was the best thing that could have happened to my career. Because in addition to having the slightly greater financial security that it gave me and my children, it gave me the ability, I, I developed so much more expertise in the probate family court. I now represent men, women, young, old, with very high assets, with no assets, all the kinds of cases that come into that court guardianships of minors, grandparent visitation cases, conservatorships, guardianships. Um, I became trained as a guardian ad litem, and I started getting more and more appointments from the court in those contested custody cases, contested removal cases, um, and guardianship of minor cases. I have been appointed guardian ad litem on behalf of incapacitated persons as well in um, guardianship and conservatorship matters. Um, I became 
became a trained mediator. Um, and then I was also fortunate enough that I work for a firm that supports me in continuing to give back to the community. I do volunteer as lawyer of the day. I volunteer in the court conciliation program. I volunteer in the attorneys representing children program. And I volunteer for some local nonprofit agencies and provide legal advice to their clients. So that brings me to today. Um, people up here and other, where, other places have asked me, why do you want to be a judge? And the answer that I give them is, I don't want to be a judge. I want to be a probate and family court judge. This is the court that I have a passion for. I want to try to continue to help the children and families of the Commonwealth. I feel that between my legal skills and background, my temperament, my compassion for the litigants, that I will do a good job. And I humbly um, ask for your support of my nomination, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, uh, let me say, of course, I so appreciate the fact that you spent with me now. Kate, you. last week, you spent with now with business assets. <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> we did have this conversation, too, already. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, you work six 